In this video, we're going to take a look at the Colombo crime family. Let's start with Joe Gallo, a notorious figure in the criminal underworld, rose through the ranks as an enforcer and hitman under the tutelage of Joe Profaci, the formidable leader of the Profaci crime family. However, their alliance took a treacherous turn when Profaci allegedly ordered Gallo and his crew to carry out the cold-blooded murder of Albert Anastasia, the boss of the rival Gambino crime family. This lethal request came at the behest of Carlo Gambino, Anastasia's ambitious underboss who sought to seize power. The fateful day arrived on October 25th as Anastasia unsuspectingly entered a barbershop located in Midtown Manhattan's Park Sheraton Hotel. In a calculated execution, two masked assailants barged in, pushing the barber aside and unleashed a barrage of bullets upon the unsuspecting Gambino boss. Although the identities of Anastasia's killers remained shrouded in mystery, Carmine Persico later boasted that he and Gallo had carried out the hit, humorously referring to himself as part of Gallo's barbershop quintet. The following year proved to be a pivotal moment for Gallo and his brothers, as they were summoned to Washington, D.C., to testify before the McClellan Committee of the United States Senate, tasked with investigating organized crime. During their visit, Gallo audaciously flirted with the Secretary of Senate Counsel Robert F. Kennedy, and even made a remark about Kennedy's office carpet being ideal for a dice game. However, when questioned on the stand, the Gallo brothers provided no valuable information to the committee. But it was on February 27, 1961 that the Gallo siblings orchestrated a shocking act of retaliation. They brazenly kidnapped four of Profaci's top men, including underboss Joseph Magliocco, Frank Profaci, Joe Profaci's brother, Captain Salvatore Musacchia, and soldier John Simone. Despite Profaci managing to evade capture and finding sanctuary in Florida, the Gallows held the hostages captive while Larry and Albert dispatched their brother Joe to California. In a bid to secure a more favorable financial arrangement, the brothers demanded their demands be met for the hostages' release. Joe, however, harbored a more violent plan, wanting to execute one of the captives and demand a hefty ransom of $100,000 before engaging in negotiations. Larry, overriding his brother's intentions, rejected the notion. Following several weeks of tense negotiation, Profaci and his consigliere, Charles the Sige Lo Cicero, struck a deal with the Gallows, ultimately leading to the peaceful release of the hostages. Regrettably, Profaci had no intention of honoring the fragile peace agreement. On August 20, 1961, he ordered the brutal murders of Larry Gallo and Joseph Joe Gelli Gioielli, a member of the Gallo crew. Reports suggest that gunmen lured Gioielli into a deadly trap under the guise of a fishing trip. In a chilling encounter at the Sahara Club in East Flatbush, Larry narrowly escaped death when Persico and Salvatore Sally D'Ambrosio attempted to strangle him. Thankfully, their sinister plans were thwarted by the timely intervention of a vigilant police officer. In light of Persico's betrayal, the Gallo brothers denounced him as the Snake, having once been allies against Profaci and his loyalists. The ensuing gang war raged on, leaving a trail of bloodshed with nine lives claimed and three individuals mysteriously vanishing. Seeking refuge, the Gallo crew sought sanctuary in the dormitory. Later that year, Persico found himself indicted for the attempted murder of Larry Gallo. However, due to Larry's refusal to testify, the charges against Persico were ultimately dropped. November 1961 proved to be a significant turning point for Gallo as he faced the consequences of his criminal activities. He was convicted of conspiracy and extortion for his attempt to extract money from a businessman. On December 21st of that same year, the infamous mobster was sentenced to serve a term of 7 to 14 years behind bars, marking the end of his reign of violence, betrayal, and unchecked power. Profaci's demise marked the beginning of a turbulent period for the Profaci crime family. Following a prolonged illness, Profaci succumbed to cancer on June 7, 1962. With his passing, the reins of power were handed over to Joseph Magliocco, who continued the fierce rivalry with Gallo's brothers. The feud escalated on May 19, 1963, when a Gallo hit squad targeted Persico, unleashing a hail of bullets. Miraculously, Persico managed to survive the assassination attempt, defying the odds. Amidst the escalating violence, negotiations were initiated between the warring factions. In 1963, Raymond L.S. Patriarca, the boss of the Patriarca crime family, played a pivotal role in brokering a peace agreement between the Gallo crew and the Profaci family. However, Gallo, serving his prison sentence at the time, claimed that the peace accord did not apply to him as he had not been involved in its negotiation. As the year progressed, the commission, a governing body overseeing organized crime families, forced Magliocco to step down from his position. The commission's decision came after uncovering his involvement in a plot to overthrow their authority. In Magliocco's place, Joseph Colombo, a close ally of Gambino, was installed as the new boss of the Profaci family, subsequently renaming it the Colombo crime family 
However, Colombo's actions soon caused a rift with Gambino, particularly due to his establishment of the Italian-American Civil Rights League and the ensuing media attention it attracted. In a dramatic turn of events, Gallo's prison sentence reached its end and he regained his freedom on April 11, 1971. With his release, the stage was set for the notorious mobster to re-enter the treacherous world of organized crime, leaving many to wonder what his next move would be. In the aftermath of Joe Gallo's release from prison, a fateful encounter took place between Gallo and the new boss of the Colombo crime family, Joseph Colombo, along with Joseph Iacovelli. Seeking to broker a peace agreement, Colombo and Iacovelli extended an invitation to Gallo for a meeting, accompanied by a meager offering of $1,000 as a gesture of goodwill. However, Gallo made it abundantly clear that he did not consider himself bound by the 1963 peace agreement and demanded a substantial sum of $100,000 to settle the ongoing dispute. Unwilling to meet Gallo's financial demands, Colombo refused his request. On June 28, 1971, during the second rally of the Italian-American Civil Rights League organized by Colombo, Colombo was tragically shot. In the bustling surroundings of Columbus Circle in Manhattan, Colombo was targeted by an African-American gunman identified as Jerome A. Johnson. Johnson unleashed three bullets at Colombo, with one piercing his head. In a swift response, Colombo's vigilant bodyguard swiftly neutralized Johnson, resulting in his immediate death. While Colombo survived the shooting, he was left paralyzed until his demise in May 1978. The shooting sent shockwaves through the Colombo family, and many within its ranks harbored suspicions that Gallo was behind the assassination attempt. However, after thorough police investigations and questioning of Gallo, law enforcement ultimately concluded that Johnson had acted as a lone gunman. Despite this conclusion, the Colombo leadership remained convinced that Gallo had orchestrated the murder, attributing it to their deteriorating relationship with him. The shooting incident further deepened the divisions and tensions within the Colombo crime family, plunging them into a state of internal turmoil and uncertainty. The aftermath of this violent event would continue to reverberate, leaving the criminal underworld anxiously awaiting the next chapter in this gripping saga of betrayal and power struggles. In the aftermath of the Colombo shooting, a meeting of high-ranking members of the Colombo family took place to determine the course of action. Underboss Salvatore Charlie Lemons Mineo was initially approached to assume the role of interim boss, but he declined due to his advanced age and declining health. Instead, Mineo recommended conciliar Joseph Joey Yak Iacovelli to serve as the acting boss. Despite the belief within the Colombo family leadership that Joe Gallo orchestrated the attack on Joseph Colombo, Iacovelli chose not to immediately seek revenge against Gallo. The New York Police Department's involvement may have influenced Iacovelli's decision. The police, while not implicating Gallo in the Colombo shooting, had assigned officers to protect Gallo from any potential harm, making it difficult for the Colombo family to exact revenge. Moreover, a quick retaliation against Gallo could escalate tensions and draw unwanted attention from law enforcement. By early 1972, the media attention surrounding the Colombo shooting had subsided, leading to an open contract being placed on Gallo's life. Fearing further reprisal attempts from the Gallo crew, Iacovelli chose to flee New York. With Iacovelli on the run and Minio unwilling to assume the top position, Carmine Persico, a powerful captain and leader of a significant faction within the family, saw an opportunity to solidify his control. However, Persico himself was already serving a prison sentence on federal hijacking charges, complicating his ascent to the boss position. As a result, Vincenzo Aloy, another capo and son of respected former Captain Sebastiano Booster Aloy, took over as the acting boss. Aloy's time in this role, however, was short-lived, as he was convicted of perjury on June 26, 1973, for lying to a grand jury. In the early hours of April 7, 1972, the occasion of Joe Gallo's 43rd birthday took a tragic turn at Umberto's Clam House in the heart of Manhattan's Little Italy. Accompanied by his sister Carmela, wife Sina, her daughter Lisa, his trusted bodyguard Peter, Pete the Greek Diapolis, and Diapolis's girlfriend Gallo arrived at the restaurant to celebrate with his family. Earlier that evening, the group had enjoyed an outing at the Copacabana, attending a performance by comedian Don Rickles and singer Peter Lemangelo. Rickles and Lemangelo, who had been invited to join the birthday celebration at Umberto's, found a way to excuse themselves from the engagement, perhaps unknowingly saving their own lives. Little did Gallo know that among the patrons at the bar that evening was Joseph Luparelli, an associate of the Colombo crime family. As soon as Luparelli spotted Joe, he allegedly made a swift exit from Umberto's and made his way to a nearby Colombo hangout. It was there that Luparelli claimed to have contacted Joseph Iacovelli, another member of the Colombo family. According to Luparelli's account, he recruited Philip Gambino, an associate of the Colombo family, as well as Carmine Sonny Pinto de Bies, 
a soldier in the Genovese crime family and two other individuals reputedly affiliated with the Patriarca family, to carry out the assassination of Joe Gallo. Their belief stemmed from the notion that the Colombo family had put a contract on Joe Gallo's life. The events unfolded rapidly at Umberto's. Luparelli stated that he remained in the car while the other four men, armed with 32 and 38 caliber revolvers, entered the restaurant through the back door. In the midst of enjoying their seafood courses, the four gunmen entered the dining room and opened fire. Joe, swearing and attempting to draw his own handgun, became the primary target of the barrage of bullets. 20 shots rang out, hitting Joe multiple times in the back, elbow, and buttock. Displaying remarkable resilience, Joe overturned a butcher block dining table in an effort to shield himself and then staggered toward the front door. Witnesses recalled Joe's brave attempt to draw the gunfire away from his family. During the onslaught, Diapolis was also shot once in the hip. Severely wounded, Gallo managed to stumble into the street before collapsing. He was quickly transported by police to Beekman Downtown Hospital, but his injuries proved fatal and he was pronounced dead at approximately 5.30 a.m. Luparelli's version of events gained considerable attention in the media, but it was met with skepticism by the police. NYPD homicide detective Joe Coffey, who inherited the murder case, maintained that based on eyewitness accounts and crime scene reconstruction, the prevailing belief among law enforcement was that a single individual had carried out the shooting. Coffey further asserted that the police intentionally circulated a false narrative of three shooters to confuse potential witnesses or informants, deeming anyone who reported multiple gunmen as unreliable. Author Charles Brandt highlights the lack of corroborating evidence for Luparelli's confession and notes that it did not lead to any arrests. Brandt speculates that Luparelli's statement may have been a deliberate disinformation tactic ordered by higher-ranking members of the Colombo family to defuse tensions following the Gallo shooting. Notably, Umbertos was under the ownership of individuals associated with the Genovese crime family, suggesting a potential blessing from the Genovese family for the killing. However, Luparelli's account, portraying the shooting as a spontaneous and unplanned act, without the approval of high-ranking mafiosi, served to alleviate pressure between the feuding Colombo and Genovese families. Following the tumultuous events involving Joseph Colombo and Joe Gallo, the Colombo crime family experienced a period of relative calm and stability, albeit with a decline in power. After Colombo's death, leadership of the family fell to Thomas de Bella, a seasoned figure skilled at evading law enforcement since his bootlegging conviction in 1932. However, Debella struggled to prevent the encroachment of the rival Gambino family on Colombo's criminal operations, leading to a weakening of the family's influence. Debella's health began to deteriorate, forcing him into retirement in 1977, and shortly thereafter, Joseph Colombo passed away in 1978. This created a power vacuum within the Colombo family, leaving the question of succession unresolved. Throughout the 1970s, Carmine Persico had emerged as a prominent figure within the family and was widely viewed as the natural choice for the role of boss. Let's take a closer look at mobster Thomas Tommy Schatz Gioeli. Thomas Gioeli was born in 1953 in Farmingdale, Long Island, to Salvatore and Julie Gioeli. He first met the Profaccia Colombo family when he was a teenager despite his parents' lack of ties to organized crime. However, by the time he was 19, Joely had become close friends with a local kid named Jojo, whose father happened to be one of the rising stars within the Colombo crime family. Andrew Andy Mush Russo, an influential figure in the criminal underworld, had moved his family and criminal operations to Long Island, representing his imprisoned cousin, boss Carmine Jr. Persico, at various mob gatherings across the country. Before long, Joely and Jojo became prominent figures in the mafia circles of both Brooklyn and Russo's Long Island. One of their acquaintances, Reynold Ren Maragni, a self-proclaimed tough guy from Bensonhurst who later became a Colombo captain, fondly recalled their first meeting in the 1970s at Monte's Venetian, a historic Carroll Street establishment that enjoyed favor with both the Colombo family and the legendary Frank Sinatra. FBI searched Joely's residence. They stumbled upon a photo from 1972 that captured Tommy and Jojo, both beaming with delight in front of a candy store in Farmingdale. During the mid-1980s, Thomas Jueli found himself behind bars for a robbery, marking his initial encounter with incarceration. Following his release from prison, Jueli ascended to the rank of a full-fledged member within the Colombo family. In the late 1980s, he commenced his employment under the leadership of Vittorio Vic Arena, a prominent figure within the Colombo Brooklyn faction and one of the family's most lucrative earners. Jueli was building a powerful reputation among the Colombos. Recently, John Marzulli of the New York Daily News uncovered an interesting detail about Jueli's life. 
He possessed a press pass from Long Island's Nightlife magazine that had expired in 1987. This discovery has shed light on Gioeli's past and his connection to the magazine. Nightlife magazine editor Michael Coutinho explained Gioeli's press credentials as the magazine was doing a nightclub promotion in the Hamptons and Gioeli worked for a company that provided attractive cigarette girls for the event. It's understandable that this revelation may bring up questions and emotions for Gioeli and those close to him. In 1982, Gioeli was allegedly involved in the unintentional killing of Veronica Zura, a former Catholic nun. This tragic incident occurred when Zura was struck by a stray bullet during the assassination of Colombo mobster Joseph Pereno. A government witness named Dino Calabro claimed that Gioeli confided in him, expressing remorse and feeling condemned for taking the life of a nun. However, Gioeli continues to assert his innocence, and no formal charges related to Zura's death have been brought against him. Moving to 1997, Gioeli was purportedly implicated in the murder of Ralph Doles, a member of the New York Police Department, NYPD. The order for Doles' execution came from Colombo Consigliere Joel Kakach, who held a personal vendetta against Doles due to his marriage to Kakachi's ex-wife, Kim Kenna. Allegedly, Gioeli acted as the intermediary for Kakachi, arranging for Dino Calabro and Colombo mobster Dino Saracino to carry out the shooting of Doles outside his Brooklyn residence. In 1989, Carmine Persico, the incarcerated Colombo boss, temporarily appointed Orina as the acting head of the family. By 1991, Orina, with support from Gambino crime family boss John Gotti, felt confident enough to challenge Persico for complete control of the Colombo family. In retaliation, Persico attempted to assassinate Orina in 1991, igniting a violent internal conflict within the Colombo family, pitting the Persico and Orina factions against each other. This would be later called the Second Colombo Wars. Gioeli threw his support behind Arena, and the conflict escalated into bloody shootouts in 1991 that resulted in the murders of prominent Arena loyalists. As the war unfolded, many Arena supporters switched allegiances to the Persico faction to avoid becoming casualties. In 1991, Gioeli himself changed sides, becoming the top lieutenant and protege of the notorious hitman, Gregory Scarpa Sr. On June 12, 1991, Gioeli, along with Calabro and soldier Joseph Compatiello, is alleged to have committed the murder of Frank Marassa, an Orina loyalist. The motive behind Marassa's killing was reportedly linked to false accusations connecting him to the murder of another Colombo associate. On March 25, 1992, Thomas Gioeli and Dino Calabro were allegedly involved in the killing of John Minerva and Michael Imbergamo, who were sitting in a parked car on Long Island at the time. Minerva's murder was reportedly driven by his affiliation as a Colombo soldier within the Arena faction. Tragically, Imbergamo, who was a friend of Minerva's and had no involvement in organized crime, also lost his life in the incident. Just two days later, on March 27, 1992, Gioeli and a group of loyalists aligned with Carmine Persico found themselves in an ambush that escalated into a high-speed car chase. During the pursuit, Gioeli sustained gunshot wounds to the shoulder and stomach. This ordeal earned him the nickname Tommy Shots and solidified his reputation as a formidable and resilient figure within the criminal world. In the same year, 1992, Arena faced arrest and subsequent indictment on charges of racketeering and murder. By 1993, Joseph Scopo, one of the few remaining allies of Orena, met a tragic end when he was killed. Orena was ultimately sentenced to life in prison, marking the apparent victory of the Persico faction. With Carmine Persico's son, Alphonse Little Alley Boy Persico, now effectively in charge, the family's leadership shifted once again. During the late 1990s, Carmine Persico and John DeRoss elevated Thomas Gioli to the position of captain within the Colombo family, marking a significant promotion within the organized crime hierarchy. On August 3, 1995, Gioeli and a group of other mobsters were allegedly involved in the murder of Colombo associate Richard Greaves in Dino Saracino's basement apartment. Greaves had expressed his desire to depart from the Colombo family and relocate to the Midwest, seeking permission from the family's leadership. However, due to concerns that Greaves might cooperate with law enforcement as a government witness, the leaders ordered his execution. Gioeli is said to have played a role in this murder and allegedly buried Greaves' body in an industrial park located in Farmingdale, New York. In May 1999, Gioeli, along with Dino Calabro and Dino Saracino, were allegedly responsible for the murder of William Cutolo, who had recently assumed the role of Colombo underboss. Alphonse Persico, who was facing a gun possession conviction in Florida, was apprehensive that Cutolo, a former lieutenant of the Orina faction, might attempt to seize control of the Colombo family. As a result, Persico ordered Cutolo to meet him in a park in Brooklyn. Subsequently, Gioeli, Calabro, and Saracino allegedly brought Cutolo to Saracino's residence, where they reportedly carried out his murder. Gioeli is believed to have buried Cutolo in the same location in Farmingdale, New York, 
where he had buried Greaves four years earlier. Following the conviction of acting boss Joel Kakachi in 2004, Gioeli was promoted to the position of street boss. In this role, he worked closely with his protege Paul Bavacqua, who served as an acting captain. Gioeli's responsibilities included interfacing with Carmine Persico and conveying messages to other influential figures within the Colombo family, such as Vincent and Benny Alloy, John Franzese and John de Ross. On June 4, 2008, Thomas Gioeli was hit with a series of indictments that included charges of robbery, extortion, and involvement in the murders of Frank Marassa in 1991 and the 1992 killings of John Minerva and Michael Imbergamo. The robbery charge stemmed from an incident in 1991 when Gioeli allegedly posed as a customer during a fur shop heist. Later on December 16, 2008, additional charges were brought against Gioeli, this time for his alleged involvement in the 1995 murder of Richard Greaves and the 1999 murder of William Cutolo. While Alphonse Persico had been convicted in 2007 for ordering Cutolo's murder, prosecutors initially lacked sufficient evidence to indict Gioeli. However, by 2008, both Dino Calabro and Joseph Compatiello had become government witnesses, planning to testify against Gioeli. On February 9, 2010, Gioeli suffered a minor stroke and was briefly hospitalized. He had previously petitioned the court on February 8, seeking release from jail due to his medical problems, which included diabetes and cardiac issues. Gioeli also raised concerns about his dental problems, the quality of jail food, and what he alleged to be unsanitary practices in the dispensation of his medication. In July 2010, Gioeli faced another indictment, this time for his alleged involvement in the 1997 murder of Ralph Doles. On May 9, 2012, a jury delivered a mixed verdict. Gioeli was cleared of the Cutolo and Doles murders, but was convicted of racketeering conspiracy related to the Minerva and Marassa cases. On March 19, 2014, Gioeli was sentenced to 18 years and 8 months in prison, and was also ordered to pay $360,000 in restitution. As of September 2015, Thomas Gioeli was incarcerated in the low-security wing of the Federal Correctional Complex in Butner, North Carolina. His projected release date was set for May 7, 2024. Let's take a closer look at mobster Theodore Skinny Teddy Persico Jr., who is a reputed Colombo captain. Skinny Teddy recently came clean about his role in a labor union extortion operation, which shocked the criminal underground. When the federal government started cracking down on the Colombo family illegal activities in 2021, this diabolical plot led to the demise of the entire leadership of the organization. The guilty plea was entered by Skinny Teddy at the Brooklyn Federal Court, where he confessed to racketeering charges. As a consequence of his actions, he is now expected to serve a significant six-year term behind bars in a federal prison. It's worth noting that Theodore Persico Jr. is renowned for being the nephew of the notorious Colombo boss, Carmen the Snake Persico, adding another layer of intrigue to this criminal saga. This courtroom revelation sends a strong message to those involved in organized crime that the long arm of the law will not rest until justice is served. Theodore Skinny Teddy Persico, who is 59 years old, is the most well-known member of the once-dominant Colombo crime family to take a plea agreement in connection with the investigation that resulted in the arrest of numerous senior figures. Among those who have previously entered guilty pleas are former boss Andrew Mush Russo, underboss Benjamin Benji Castellazzo, conciliere Ralph DiMatteo, and Captain Richard Ferrara and Vincent Ricciardo. It should be noted that Ricciardo is anticipated to make a guilty plea on Friday, following the lead of DiMatteo, who recently entered a guilty plea on July 6th. All 14 of the case's suspects, with the exception of the late Russo, who died in April 2022 at the age of 87, will have entered guilty pleas after these upcoming convictions. The downfall of such prominent figures within the Colombo family marks a significant victory for law enforcement in their ongoing battle against organized crime. The extensive cooperation of these individuals in accepting responsibility for their actions is likely to have a considerable impact on the prosecution's efforts to dismantle the criminal network that once held substantial power and influence. The Colombo crime family started extorting labor unions back in 2001, and over time, their leadership devised a cunning scheme to seize control of the Queen's Union, which is in charge of representing construction workers in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. They intended to turn it into a gang-run business, stealing from official salaries and using the health fund for their own illegal gain. One of the key players in this criminal operation was Vincent Ricciardo, also known as Vinnie Unions. He went to extreme lengths, even resorting to threats of violence, including murder, against a construction union boss who was coerced into handing over a portion of his earnings to the Mafia. By 2019, federal prosecutors had identified Theodore Skinny Teddy Persico as the prospective leader of the Colombo family, 
referring to him as the boss-to-be in official documents. His criminal history dates back to 1981 when, at just 17 years old, he was apprehended for attempted grand larceny on Staten Island. Subsequently, he served a lengthy 17-year prison sentence for drug dealing until his release in 2004. Even during his time behind bars, Persico remained actively involved in the mob's deadly affairs. In 1993, while on a brief furlough to attend his grandmother's wake, he orchestrated the assassination of Joseph Scopo, a member of a rival faction within the Colombo family. These accounts reveal a deeply entrenched history of crime and violence within the Colombo crime family, with individuals like Theodore Persico and Vincent Ricciardo orchestrating and participating in a series of illegal activities that perpetuated their organization's reign of terror. In 2012, Skinny Teddy pleaded guilty to a charge of murder conspiracy and received a 10-year sentence. After that, he was granted supervised release in May 2020. Persico promised Brooklyn federal judge Sandra Towns at his 2014 sentencing that he would use every effort to stay out of the criminal activities. However, the future of Persico inside the company came up in conversations with Colombo family members at the prestigious Brennan and Carr restaurant in Brooklyn during the year 2020. After his supervised release was over, it was agreed that he would be named to succeed the late Andrew Mush Russo in the leadership position. Persico pleaded guilty to racketeering charges, specifically admitting to involvement in extortion conspiracy and money laundering conspiracy concerning the labor union plot. While the maximum sentence for this charge stands at 20 years, prosecutors expect to recommend a term of only 71 months. If the sentence were to exceed 105 months, Persico would have the option to appeal. The sentencing is scheduled for October 17th, and when Persico mentioned that it coincided with his fiancée's birthday, Judge Hector Gonzalez humorously remarked that she could attend court. As for their wedding plans, Persico's lawyer, Joseph Carrozzo, indicated that the timing would depend on the sentence, expressing hope for an early ceremony. The situation highlights the intricate legal proceedings and personal factors at play amidst the backdrop of organized crime involvement. Let's check out Colombo legend Carmine Persico. Born into a family with deep ties to organized crime, Persico inherited a legacy steeped in violence and ambition. Growing up in the rough neighborhoods of Carroll Gardens and Red Hook, Persico quickly established himself as a force to be reckoned with, leading the notorious Garfield Boys gang. Despite dropping out of high school at a young age, he was already making waves in the criminal underworld. At just 17, Persico found himself entangled in a murder case, accused of beating a rival youth to death in Prospect Park. However, fate seemed to favor him as all charges were mysteriously dropped, leaving him free to pursue a life of crime. Recruited into the Profaci crime family, Persico wasted no time climbing the ranks under the tutelage of seasoned Captain Frank Abatamarco. From bookmaking and loan sharking to more daring endeavors like burglaries and hijackings, Persico proved himself as a versatile and ruthless operator. Alongside his criminal exploits, Persico formed alliances with the likes of Joe Gallo and his brothers, forging connections that would shape the course of his criminal career. As the years passed, Persico's influence within the Colombo crime family only grew solidifying his status as a formidable figure in the New York underworld. With his son following in his footsteps and a network of loyal associates at his side, Persico's grip on power seemed unshakable. But in a world where betrayal lurked around every corner and alliances were as fragile as they were lucrative, Persico's reign was far from secure. With rivals plotting in the shadows and law enforcement closing in, his empire faced its most perilous challenge yet. And in the heart of Brooklyn, where loyalty was currency and bloodshed was inevitable, Carmine Persico's legacy would be written in blood. As tensions simmered within the ranks of organized crime in New York City, Carmine Persico found himself embroiled in a bitter power struggle against his own boss, Joe Profaci. Alongside the Gallo brothers, Persico grew increasingly disillusioned with Profaci's authoritarian rule. The conflict erupted into open warfare on November 4, 1959, with the brazen assassination of Persico's mentor, Frank Abatamarco, on the streets of Brooklyn. Abatamarco's refusal to continue paying tribute to Profaci, backed by the Gallo faction, signaled the beginning of what would be known as the First Colombo War. Suspicions swirled that powerful figures like Carlo Gambino and Tommy Lucchese were backing the Gallos in their bid to challenge Profaci's dominance. When Profaci retaliated by seizing Abatamarco's lucrative operations from the Gallos, the conflict escalated into a full-blown turf war. In a bold move on February 27, 1961, the Gallows, led by Crazy Joe Gallo, staged a daring kidnapping operation, snatching four of Profaci's top lieutenants. Among the captives were Profaci's underboss, Joseph Magliocco, and his own brother, Frank Profaci. Faced with this brazen challenge to his authority, Profaci fled to safety in Florida, leaving his men at the mercy of the gallows. 
As tensions reached a fever pitch, negotiations between the Gallows and Profaci's representatives, including future underboss John Sonny Frances, ultimately resulted in a peaceful resolution. All hostages were released unharmed, but the scars of the conflict would linger, leaving a trail of bloodshed in its wake. In the cutthroat world of organized crime, alliances were fragile, and loyalties were constantly tested, leaving Carmine Persico and his associates poised on a knife's edge of treachery and retribution. Let's analyze Colombo mobster Joel Cacasi, also known as Joe Waverly, a former consigliere of the Colombo crime family. Joe Waverly kept up close ties with Victor Arena, who occasionally served as acting boss, and Luca De Matteo, a well-known captain in the Colombo organization. Joe Waverly was notorious for his alleged involvements in a variety of illegal activities, including extortion, illegal gambling operations, and the audacious hijacking and subsequent black market trade of sizable consignments of cigarettes. Joe Waverly is said to have solidified his status as a real mafia member in the late 1960s. In a dramatic turn of events on December 20th, 1976, Joe Waverly found himself targeted by three assailants in a calculated ambush just outside his florist shop situated in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Amidst the chaos, Joe Waverly exhibited remarkable courage as he valiantly fought back despite sustaining a gunshot wound to his chest. Summoning his inner strength, he managed to overpower one of the robbers and, in an act of self-defense, successfully eliminated the threat by fatally shooting the assailant. Overwhelmed by their failed endeavor, the remaining criminals hastily fled the scene. In a state of critical injury, Joe Waverly had remarkable courage as he determinedly drove himself with the lifeless body of the fallen assailant in the back seat to a nearby police station seeking assistance. During the early months of 1987, Carmine Persico, the imprisoned boss of the Colombo crime family, issued a chilling directive to Joe Waverly. Persico, feeling aggrieved by the perceived disrespect shown to the Cosa Nostra by federal prosecutors William Ehrenwald and Rudy Giuliani, ordered Joe Waverly to eliminate them both. While the assassination of prosecutors was typically prohibited in the traditions of the Cosa Nostra, Persico was unwavering in his desire for their demise. To carry out the sinister plan, Joe Waverly enlisted the services of Vincent and Eddie Carnini, providing them with a piece of paper bearing the name Ehrenwald. However, an unfortunate twist of fate unfolded as George Ehrenwald, the father of William Ehrenwald, and an administrative law judge who shared an office with his son, became the unintended target. Tragically, on March 20th, 1987, the Carnini brothers executed their mission, mistakenly killing George Ehrenwald Sr. at a laundromat near his residence. The leaders of the remaining New York Five Families were enraged by the unexpected repercussions of George Ehrenwald's death and demanded retaliation from the Colombo criminal family. In a fit of fury, Joe Waverly enlisted the help of the Lucchese members, Carmine Variale, and Bonanno crime family's member Frank Santora to carry out a dreadful mission, the murder of the Carnini brothers. The two Carnini brothers were found dead in the back seats of their cars in the fateful month of June 1987, having been the targets of a well-planned hit in the streets of Brooklyn. Joe Waverly, in a cunning act of prudence, had doubts about the allegiance of Variale and Santora, his hired killers. He decided to exterminate them as well out of fear for the dangers they might cause. It is claimed that Joe Waverly gave a second group of hitmen, the names Variale and Santora at the mournful funeral for the Carnini brothers. The dead remains of Variale and Santora were found outside a Brooklyn social club as September of the same year approached, their horrific deaths being witnessed by the open air in the middle of the day. Joe Waverly was able to avoid early suspicion by temporarily concealing his role in the murder of Ehrenwald, thanks to this unusual level of vigilance. In the year 1987, Joe Waverly found himself entangled in yet another murder case, unrelated to the previous incidents. This time, the victim was Carlo Antonino, a former officer of the New York Police Department. Despite the fallout from the Ehrenwald affair, Joe Waverly's reputation for brutality solidified his standing among his associates. A member of his own crew once said, with Joe, you never know where his attitude is coming from. In the aftermath of the Carnini murders, Eddie Carnini's widow, Kim Kenna, began to have a relationship with Joe and eventually got married to him. However, their union was short-lived and they soon separated, culminating in a divorce. In the midst of the 1990s Colombo War, specifically in January 1991, Joe Waverly made an attempt on the life of Gregory Scarpa, a notorious hitman aligned with the Persico faction. Joe aligned himself with temporary acting boss Victor Arena, who challenged Carmine Persico for control of the family. Employing a calculated approach, Joe Waverly drove up beside Scarpa's vehicle in Sheepshead Bay, opening fire multiple times in an attempt to eliminate him. Miraculously, Scarpa managed to escape unharmed, 
The rivalry escalated further on February 26, 1992 as both mobsters engaged in another shootout outside a social club in the same neighborhood. Station gunmen unleashed a hail of gunfire, firing 14 shots at Joe Waverly while he was visiting his dry cleaner. Although sustaining a stomach injury, Joe Waverly demonstrated remarkable resilience by drawing his own firearm and exchanging shots with the assailants. Colombo enforcer Greg Scarpa later boasted about his involvement in the attempted assassination of Joe Waverly. As the Colombo War unfolded, Joe Waverly ultimately switched sides, aligning himself with the Persico faction, which eventually emerged victorious. Over the years, Joe Waverly's legal journey included a number of important detours. Joe Waverly was charged with the killings of Carlo Antonino, William Aaronwald, Carmine Variale, and Frank Santora on January 23, 2003. Then on August 13, 2004, Joe Waverly entered a guilty plea, admitting his role in the four aforementioned homicides, unlawful gambling, and extortion. As a result, he was given a 20-year prison term on September 8, 2004. Joe Waverly was first detained at ADX Florence in Florence, Colorado, before being sent to the U.S. Penitentiary in Beaumont, Texas. However, on December 18, 2008, Joe Waverly faced fresh charges for orchestrating the murder of Ralph Doles, an officer of the New York Police Department in 1997. The indictment alleged that Joe harbored feelings of humiliation due to Doles, a Latino, marrying Joe Waverly, former wife Kim. According to the prosecution, Joe ordered Colombo Captain Dino Calabro and Soldier Dino Saracino to carry out the execution. On August 25, 1997, it was claimed that Calabro and Saracino ambushed Doles outside his Brooklyn residence, shooting him to death. On November 26, 2013, a jury found Joe Waverly not guilty of the charges related to the killing of Ralph Doles. Joe Waverly was detained at the Tucson Federal Correctional Institution in Tucson, Arizona, following the judicial processes before being sent to the low-security FCI Ashland in Kentucky. Joe Waverly prison sentence came to an end on May 22, 2020, when he was finally released. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more character breakdowns and analysis of your favorite gangsters. See you in the next one.